I'm going to kick off with uh, Alistair McClymont, whose work has come to my attention quite recently, uh, and he makes some really beautiful artworks uh, and has some extraordinary making abilities. So he's going to tell you about some of his projects. Alistair. Hi there. Um, I think I'll start talking about an artwork that I found silent, I think. Yeah, this is, this is an artwork um, that kind of started off the idea of me making machines, I think, which is a sort of the subject of these talks. So, actually, this isn't the artwork. This is, this is a still from The Wizard of Oz, which might be obvious. But I made a piece um, in 2005 that was a kind of mashup between The Wizard of Oz and Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, which is this stoner urban myth where you watch <coughs> The Wizard of Oz, listen to Dark Side of the Moon, and everything synchronizes which was fun, um, and, but I, then that got me interested in, in, a, in the tornado, so I thought the tornado was the most fascinating thing about that film. And so I wanted to make a tornado, and being um, British, and not having much of a chance to see one, I thought the best thing to do would be to make my own. Um, so this is, this is um, the thing I made, and it's about, um, if you stood in there, you probably come up to about here or so. It's about eight foot, eight foot, ten foot tall, or something like that. Um, and I, I, I wanted to have the experience of seeing the thing. I also wanted to understand about it. I, I, I suppose it comes from most of my art has this um, has this desire to see something beautiful, but then also to to learn about it and have this idea of knowledge within the art. So the the piece is is, is stripped back to the to the minimal necessary uh, bits in order to make a tornado. So you've got a fan at the top and then two fans on the sides, um, and that's kind of all you need to make a tornado. Though it's, it's really shooting it is kind of tricky. It's sort of really. It, it took about two years to, to figure out exactly how to get this to work. Um, and I started off I started off looking on the web trying to get it, uh, trying, to, trying to find people who'd done this before or, or, or things like this and trying to look into tornadoes and you see them in science museums and there was some instruction manual from the fifties on how to make a tornado in a box, but they all kind of involve enclosing it and putting it in in a very controlled environment. And you get an almost perfect tube, but I wanted to make something that was a bit more like a real tornado and did its own thing and had a had a had an element of unpredictability about it. Um, and so this so this structure came uh, came back in that way and it's, and it's it's just it's just scaffolding and the bits that are, that are needed for it. So um, I think I think it's also the things about knowledge and, 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 and a, lot, a lot of my work is, is about a voyage of discovery and trying to find something. I think that beauty for me is, is about that knowledge, it's about um, understanding something. And when, you, when you're in the room with this, you can feel all the air moving slowly around the room and as you walk towards the middle of the room, the air gets faster and faster and then it's sort of, the tornado is the, is the high speed vortex in the, in the middle of all that, but you can, you can understand how it works by being in the room with it because you feel everything working. Um, and that, yeah, stop that. That's 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 another that's another version of the same piece. In um, that was shown in London. The other one was shown in Madrid. Um, but yeah, I suppose it's, it's it's this idea of trying to create something that's that's kind of beautiful. It has this idea of the sublime, perhaps, like that idea of fear and awe and knowledge, which is I suppose Kant's version of the sublime is. The idea of rationality in there, as well as you know, overtaking beauty, I suppose. But the um, it's also something that kind of gets away from you. So you start off with a process, um, you 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 kind of set a load of things in action, and then something's completely out, out of your control. And that and that sort of interested me. And this this then led on to making some drawings. Um, these are this is this is one of a series of drawings I'm making with this tornado. So. That, that bit of paper is placed on the floor and it's taped down because otherwise it flies away. And then the tornado is it's, it's on the floor beneath where the tornado uh, would normally be. And then I place hundreds of drops of ink on it 
turn on the tornado and after about a couple of minutes I turn it off again and that, that is tracing the path of the tornado so it's, I'm not sure which direction it's come on, on this one but it's, but it's moved across, swirled around a bit, moved around there, gone up the top of the page then gone off and then as soon as the tornado leaves the page I turn it off again. So it's, the, the thing isn't really created by me, it's created by the tornado and the tornado I suppose is created by me and I, I, I think I like that idea of having something you've not really touched. It's, it's sort of conceptual art that's become a, a real thing and a, it has maybe an idea of beauty in it, but it's something that isn't really mine, it's the tornado's beauty. And there's something I find fascinating about that. Um, and what have we got next? Yeah, so then this, I, I, I think doing, doing this tornado led me on to a few pieces that um, all had the. Um, all involved water, I suppose, for some reason. So I, I saw a guy on TV called Clive Saunders who wrote a paper in the 70s. This is, this is his paper, The uh, Vibrational Frequencies of Freely Falling Charged Water Drops. It's not particularly fascinating unless you're into that kind of thing. But what, what he did is he made, he was on a documentary and he, he, he had this machine that had a suspended water drop and there's a water drop hovering in front of you. And that really interested me. So I, I emailed him and he sent me this paper. And on page two of it is this little drawing, um, this thing. So this, this, this was all I had really to make this machine. And I wanted to end up with a raindrop, uh, or a simulated raindrop. Um, and then he invited me to Manchester to the university and I got to see this machine. But the machine, the machine was there but he, wasn't, he just retired. So I just saw the outside of this machine, but it was a big fiberglass box so I couldn't really see in it. But with that and chatting to some of his colleagues, I, um, I made this. Um, and you can just you can see the raindrop up there. It's, 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 a, it's a water drop. And what what's happening is you've got a, a machine that controls the airflow. So the airflow is very very laminar, really smooth, and you end up with um, a water drop that falls infinitely. But not not eventually it goes. It, it evaporates or it flies away with weird chaotic. Forces, but it's um, that that drop is falling just like a raindrop would. It's um, it's reached its terminal velocity, so it's a, so it's got as fast as it as it can get in the airflow. Um, and you can imagine if you're standing next to it, perhaps the raindrops. Well, if you're standing next to it, perhaps you're falling with the raindrop, um, free falling and alongside a drop going down beside you. So it's doing it's doing exactly what a raindrop would do. That's 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 how the machine is designed. But the idea of capturing a raindrop and being able to look at it is something so alien that I thought it'd be a really beautiful thing to try and make. And at that, that after, after about, I think, I think it was about a year it took to make this. And, and, and I ended up, um, oh, this is, yeah, this is another close up video of it. So. Um, this is, I moved the machine outside and this is, this is me looking uh, really closely at the drop, but what you're seeing is a view upside down of the world beyond the raindrop because it acts like a little lens. Um, but you end up becoming a scientist, we did, or at least using the paradigm of scientists, where to get the thing working, I tried an arrangement of wires and meshes and things in this machine, tweaked it a bit, tried it again, tweaked it a bit, tried it again, and about I think about six months doing that, you get the the best setup you can. So so now the get a drop to stay there for about half an hour on average. I think an hour is my best time. So it's a weird, it's a weird art piece and to show it, it requires a gallery assistant with a syringe and every now and again they have to go along to the raindrop and replace it. And you literally inject the drop straight into the airflow and stays there. So there's this weird perform, performative aspect to the piece. Um, so it's this strange boundary in between science and art which is I suppose why people are here in a way. But it's, it's, it's a little bit more interesting than just a thing that doesn't do anything to me. I mean, that's 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 um, that's what interests me about art. Anyway, going to do something that's a slightly slightly different, I suppose. Um, and my plan with this machine, this this is kind of the, the thing I'm doing right now. I'm developing still. Um, there's a there's, there's a, a Mark II machine uh, in process at the moment, um, and I'm going to take it on tour on my own. Um, and photograph in various locations. So I want to get photographs of the raindrop, 
I think the various coastal locations looking out to sea, um, and they'll become pieces in their own. So you'll just see a raindrop, but it'll be my raindrop, uh, which is a bit, a bit different, I think. Um, this is this is the first of those photographs, um, and it started it started its journey in my studio. So. Um, this, this is it, and it's the world outside my studio. You, you can just see a bit of, my, of the wall of my studio on the right-hand side of the raindrop there. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of odd in that you sort of, you realise that raindrops don't look like a water drop, as you, know, they, as you draw as a child. They're, they're a sphere that's flattened, and uh, that, that kind of makes more sense if you think about surface tension and stuff. But they're, they're kind of beautiful little things, but it, it's, it's so transitory, it's really hard to contain, the, the piece is hard to maintain, but you know, given all that effort, you, you, you kind of have something a bit different. Um, and I've, I've also started to make, a, another piece I did recently is, is, a, is a machine that is virtual, so this is, this is something that's called Unix time, and Unix time, if you're a computer geek, is, you'll know is, um, um, it's the way all computers record and store the time, or nearly all computers. So every, every action you do, every email you send, anytime you use a computer, things are stored in this time. And it's, and it's a really simple thing in that it's just the number of seconds since January the 1st, 1970, which is the, the birth of modern computing. Um, and it's this number that counts up continuously. So this is, this is actually a, a, a print, but it was a, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a leap second. It's just a, it's just a quirky bit of Unix time. But it, it became a um, an iPhone and iPad app. So this is this is the iPad app version of it, and it, it counts up continuously. And there's a I think I've got a desktop version I can show you. So so the this this is this is a web version on the website. This is the iPad, and and the time's always the same. I've got a, I've got a an iPhone as well. You can I mean they all it. it they all say the same time all, um, all the time, so it's, I kind of became interested in this because it was this weird um, sort of real thing. It, I mean, there, are, there is Unix time in everything, in every, in every computer you get them in, in the little valves that turn on and off your mains water and hospital equipment and military equipment in your watch and all sorts of things. Oh, yeah, you have to have a pretty special watch to have that in, I suppose. But, um, and yet, it's kind of directly linked with the way, with, with the Earth spinning, with, with the position of the sun, day and night. So, it's quite geeky and quite involved. <laughs> My work tends to go down that sort of weird alleyway sometimes. But um, it's, it's sort of spawned a number of um, other things, an interest in stars, an interest in, in the night sky. And that, and that kind of came into uh, this next piece. This is um, called Everything We Are Capable of Seeing. Um, and this, this came from me um, reading a book that had a, that referenced a poem by Keats called Lamia, which has a line in it that talks about unweaving the rainbow. And it was Keats repost to Newton. Um, he was sort of lamenting um, Newton explaining optics, explaining how a rainbow works, so light being split into the colours. Um, and Keats thought that spoiled the beauty of the rainbow. So, um, and then uh, you might have read a book by Dawkins called Unweaving the Rainbow, he, he, he referenced that as well. So I, I wanted to, um, I've been wanting to make a rainbow. I mean, it's quite a simple thing to make. You can, you, if you get a garden sprinkler in the sun, you'll see a rainbow. But by so by doing it at night time, uh, using an artificial light, you, you're kind of breaking it purely into the artificial. You you, you know you, you're just demonstrating the science of it really. Um, and I I don't agree with Keats and that in explaining something you've ruined the beauty of it. I think the beauty exists even more so once you understand. Something. I think. I think. I think. The more you learn about something, the more beautiful it becomes. And you ask questions, and they. You just get more questions. And you, you, know, you never find the absolute answer to anything. You can just keep on going. So, um, 
this, I think with, with, with this piece in particular, it's, it's sited on the Mills Observatory in Dundee, so you might just be able to make out the dome there, and it's, it's an old style observatory. Um, and I called it everything we're capable of seeing because in a rainbow you're literally seeing everything we can see. So, so, so we, we're capable of seeing a tiny fraction of the electromagnetic wavelength, so you know, we call that light. So there's all, all those colours are the, you know, the blue at one end and the red at the other end is the beginning and end of what we can see. And if you're a dog, you've only got two cones, you only see the green to the blue. And if you're a, there's this weird mantis shrimp with 16 cones that can see an amazing rainbow that has the capability to understand it. But, and I suppose in, a, on this, in this old observatory, back when they were using those observatories, they were looking to space and they were just looking in the visible wavelengths. Um, and then you understand more about light and now we use observatories with radio telescopes and x-ray telescopes and infrared telescopes and we see incredibly uh, more detailed and more beautiful imagery. And this idea of understanding something, looking into things more, getting deeper into uh, subjects, I think opens up beauty and that, that knowledge itself is beautiful. Um, and I think it's worth, yeah, I think, I, think, I think knowledge and art and knowledge and beauty are kind of the things I'm interested in, kind of things I, I think are worth looking into. Um, um, and that's sort of what this piece is about, I suppose. So, are there any questions? Uh, I'd be interested. Um, Me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. With the rain drop on, what happens if you put that outside where it's raining? <laughs> Well, yeah, join in the fun, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, with the, with the ones that fell into it, with they... Well, the way it's designed is it, it has a plate on top of it. If you took that away, then? If you took that away, it wouldn't work. Uh, so, so the way it works is you've got really fast air coming out hmm. uh, of, the, of the bottom, and then the air gradually gets slower because it's hitting a plate. Hmm. And because it's zero at the top and fast at the bottom, it finds its terminal velocity somewhere in between, so it finds the place that raindrops hmm. naturally want to fall out, so <laughs> yeah. it does work outside. Yeah. I've, got a, I've got a question which I might be asking everyone. I've worked with a lot of artists and uh, a lot of artists, if they want to do something or recreate a phenomena, go and find someone to make it for them. Mm. Um, and I'm just fascinated by the fact that you want to figure out how to do it yourself and then to make it yourself. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I. I have got people to help me in the past with things, so I've, I've made some, um, I've been making steel things recently, I've been making these big inflated steel things where I weld sheets of steel, put high pressure air into them, you get these random steel forms. I'm not great welding stainless steel with a TIG welder, so I've got a friend to do that, he's good at that. You know, for instance, those sort of things, I might get someone to help, um, just because, you know, practicalities. But, but I think the voyage of discovery of making something is really it's the fun of it, and, I, and I'm making art because I really enjoy doing it. So, um, I think, I suppose, if I didn't make things, I might make I might make art in a different way. I suppose part of the aesthetics of it is is practicality. The you know the raindrop machine is quite weird looking, but it's what I had, and it just things kind of came together. But, it, but I think you really learn about something by doing it, and that's that's quite important. So it's important for me to learn how to program an iPhone app to make the iPhone app. There's that, that dis in doing that, you discover something. I mean, it was all about computers and all that, so, <coughs> so I wanted to learn how to do that. And tinkering in my studio for six months making a raindrop work. Um, I can't think of a better way to spend my time to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a set time limit on size for a raindrop? Yeah, so it's all to do with its... Um, I, I figured this out by looking at it, it's, I didn't really know much about it, but I, I, I understood that the surface tension in water was kind of important. If you make a really big raindrop, it starts to wobble a lot, and the wobbling, the force of the wobbling becomes much greater than the surface tension force, so it flies into two different brains. Sometimes you put a really big one on, you get it to stay there for a second, and it'll explode, and a small one will remain. Normally it just flies out. And if you do a really tiny one, it's, it's so light that it will just fly away. And then somewhere in between is perfect, so if you inject just the right size one in, it'll stay there for quite a while. Because it gradually evaporates and it rises slightly as it evaporates and eventually it flies away. So there's, there's, a, there's an op so I guess that's why rain is normally a certain size. You know, you never see a raindrop <laughs> as big as your head, do you? So, it's... Your raindrop was a, a squashed sphere, mm. uh, an actual raindrop. I mean, 
God's rain, God's rain, God's rain, God's yeah. Are they sort of are they that same shape or are they elongated as they fall? No, it's exactly that shape. Really? Yeah. So, so our teardrop rain raindrop notion is completely Yeah, false. it's it, it's kind of false in a sense, in that I think that people think of raindrops as a teardrop because the only time you see anything like a raindrop is turning a tap on. Mm -hmm. and looking at one coming out, so it will squeeze out of a tap, so you think, oh that's what a raindrop must be. Mm -hmm. But given any time to fall, surface tension takes over and it, in in a vacuum it'd be a sphere, I suppose. Have you played in high speed photos of actual rain? Um, no, I no, no, I mean, I, I suppose I'm only interested in my own ring. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm interested in that. I just, I just want to, um, I, just, I mean, from what, from chatting to the scientist who did that, he said, you know, this is a story about real rain. This is, and, it, and, and thinking about how, I mean, the, mine, is fall, mine is a bit of water falling in air, so there's no reason to suppose it would behave any differently with a, with a real raindrop falling in air. It's, it's, it's only got the force is too well. Kind of, it's just it's more just there's there's air blowing up and the air gradually slows down because there's that top plate on. But that's just to find that's just to have like a gradient of speed so that somewhere in between is the right speed for the raindrop. But where where the drop is, it's it's just really sit, sitting on air pressure. It's kind of doing what exactly what a real raindrop would do. And there's some there's some stuff there's some little um, spokes some wire spokes on there, and that keeps the raindrop in there rather than let it fly out. So where the wire spokes are, the air's slower in the center than on the outside. So, because the air's moving slightly slower in the centre, it stops the raindrop flying out sideways. That's the only other thing that's different from reality. Um, well, yeah, there's a number of things different from reality, but I think, I think it is, yeah. I think it is behaving like a real raindrop, to my, to my knowledge. Yeah, in Uncle Dick, yeah, in the first piece, um, in Science Club, have yeah. you experimented with putting different colours into it to see how they mix and how they move. Yeah, I, I, I had thought about that. I mean, the, the, um, what I'm using for the, for the, for, for, for the tornado is, um, or siphon, whatever you want to call it really, it's, it's, um, it, it's a humidifier, so it's yeah. real water vapour. Um, it's cold water vapour. It, it is basically cloud. It's the same particle size as cloud. So, so I'm, I'm trying to replicate exactly what a real tornado was made of. And you can't inject colour into it. Even if you, if you put coloured water in that, because it's evaporated water, it would still just come out white. You could light it or use smoke or something like that. But I wanted to really pare it down to, to just the most minimal necessary things. Um, I, th I, th I, think, I think those things would start to go towards it would be me making choices about aesthetics and about beauty, and I wanted to remove my choice from it. I just wanted to set up the conditions to do something and then um, put, put, in, put in what was necessary to see it, and what was necessary and simplest was water vapour, which is, which is what's um, shown in there. So that's why I didn't go down the route of colour. I, mean, I, I am lighting it. Uh, you have to light it, you can't see it, so it needs backlighting. But um, I chose not to use colour. I thought it might get too theatrical. Or kind of go down a different avenue, I suppose. Yeah, I understand. I, so the piece of paper you place on the ground, mm. so you've got little dots, is that paint? It's Indian ink. Indian ink? Yeah, I just use black ink. And it, it, so that's just the movement. You just, you just want to describe yeah. movement. You don't, I mean, I'm from a painting background, mm. and I got fascinated. I thought, well, why don't you just put throw paint into it or something. Well, what I made, so I made... And that paper there, I, I, yeah, I was I, looking well, at it in a totally different way. I mean, where is it, that thing. So I, yeah. I, I made two different versions of this. There's one that's just black ink. And I'm actually using, I mean, I, I had syringes lying around, so I started... <laughs> yeah, not, you know, for the raindrop, that is. Um, and uh, the, each of these is a, is a syringed ink drop. So they sit proud. And then, you know, so then while they're all wet, the tornado can catch them and move them. And I also made coloured versions, and the coloured versions have the um, Beaufort wind scale colour chart on them, which is kind of a rainbow. It's, it's, it's similar, similar to the rainbow colours. And the Beaufort wind scale is, you know, sort of storm, it's sort of naught to storm force 12 or whatever. It's, that. it's the, the one everyone knows. So there are coloured versions of this as well. So that I, I felt like to, to go into a colour thing, I'm not, you know, I'm not, they don't come from a painting background, though, I appreciate that, but I, 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 I kind of needed an excuse to use colour, yeah. although, you know, it's so, it's really tempting and luscious, so you, I kind of wanted to go down that route, so, so there are, there are coloured versions of this as well, oh. and, but then that had to, have, for me, I have to have a tie, I have to have a reason, so it takes, you know, it takes the decisions out of my hands in a way, yeah, but so that's, so, so it has a lot of colour in that respect. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. 
there, is there another question before we move on? Um, and also, I just wanted to ask a bit more about, because um, because of your fascination with weather mm. systems, I suppose, cyclones and raindrops and rainbows and uh, whether your making has, has always, or whether your artwork has always been more than the kind of natural systems of weather. Yeah, quite a few pieces have, um, but not not all work. I think um, my my way of making a different piece of work tends to be just some sort of evolution from one piece to the next. So that's why I started off with that Wizard of Oz piece because that that was the impetus to then start thinking about a tornado. And I, I think each piece just becomes a stepping stone for the next piece. Um, the the um, I was, I, the, the quote from Keats I saw in the Cloud Spotter's Guide um, while looking at, it's quite a fun book actually, um, while, while looking at clouds to do with the imagery I was using with the Unix timepiece, and then that led me on to the, the, uh, the rainbow thing. Um, I think, I, I, yeah, I, I did make another piece. Um, I was looking at um, air fresheners a while ago, and there's a lot of air fresheners with quite bonkers names so a lot a lot of the names are they're kind of about ideas of beauty rather than actual things so, right, so there are air fresheners called you know flower smell or you know boring things like that there was, there was one called after the rain and I thought that's that's a really beautiful name so and then I thought well, the air fresheners there must be this evolutionary process whereby the ones that sound most enticing stay on the shelf the ones that don't don't get bought so they the best ones are the, are the kind of evolutionary best pieces of poetry. So I made a piece called After the Rain, because the smell of After the Rain to me was a summertime bike ride. The tarmac's really hot and it rains and you get this smell of steam coming off the tarmac. So I made a seven ton pile of tarmac with loads of infrared heaters and water sprinklers. And it called After the Rain. It's just inspired, you know, just because I've got that. And, but then that was kind of a weather piece as well. And I started seeing little tornadoes appear on the um, bits of tarmac. So by the time it got really hot, you'd see little tornadoes occasionally. And, and uh, that, that may have came before the Pink Floyd thing, I'm not sure. It was around the same time, though. 